The mainstream media have been telling us for the last three and a half years that Brexit is going to be an economic disaster. They've told us that exports will suffer and the cost of imports will increase. There'll be job losses and it'll be a catastrophe. But as economist Andrew Lillico put it, they've got the economics exactly the wrong way around. Much of the UK discussion has the normal economics exactly the wrong way around. This is the business case for Brexit. Deal or no deal. Let's start by looking at the UK economy as a whole. In 2018, the total value of all goods and services produced in the UK was approximately £2,000. £110 billion. In the UK, we consumed around 70% of that total. We exported to countries outside the EU around the world a little over 16%, and we exported a little under 14% to the European Union. Our economic activity overall is 80% in the delivery of services and 20% in the production of goods. So our exports to the EU were £289 billion in 2018 and the EU's exports to us were a little higher, around 20% higher, at £353 billion. Now just for a moment, let's imagine that the UK had been outside the EU in 2018. The tariffs on our exports that would supposedly cripple our economy would have amounted to somewhere between £5 and £6 billion. Pounds. So overall, that's a relatively small amount in comparison to the total value of our exports. In fact, that's roughly only half of our net EU membership fees, which are 10 to 12 billion pounds. That's the net figure after you take off the UK's rebate and all the money the EU spends in the UK. As Lord Peter Lilly, a previous UK government trade and industry secretary of state put it, to pay 10 billion to save 5 billion does not strike me as a rational deal. Essentially what he was pointing out was that if the UK government wanted to compensate UK exporters by giving them economic advantages, enabling them to lower their prices on exports to the EU, to counteract the cost of tariffs and therefore keep prices to EU consumers the same, the total cost of the UK Treasury would only be half that of the cost of being a member of the EU. Now to help explore this, let's just step back for a minute and look at how tariffs actually work. Let's say that a supermarket in another country buys a product from the UK for a pound. And let's say there's a tariff, which essentially is just a tax, of 10%. So the supermarket will pay the UK supplier a pound for the product, and they will pay the government in their country the tariff of 10 pence. The total cost of the product is therefore £1.10. The reason that tariffs exist is to protect domestic producers. Tariffs are designed to make imported products more expensive for consumers to buy than the locally produced alternative. So it seemed to follow that if UK producers want to carry on selling goods to the EU, they would have to reduce their prices to counteract the cost of tariffs. Well, that's not the case. That would suggest that all UK exports are all price-sensitive commodity items. Some exports, such as fruit, vegetables and animal products, are commodities and it's therefore likely that exports of these items to the EU would reduce if we did not have a free trade deal in place with the EU. But the UK is a net importer of these types of commodities, so in fact we'd most likely simply consume more UK produced goods of this type in the UK and also import less of these commodities from the EU as well. There'd be shifts in trade. We might logically see a return to slightly more seasonal eating habits due to locally produced fruit and vegetables being cheaper than EU produced alternatives. Overall, there would most likely be an increase in demand for UK produced goods in local markets, and we would import more food products from the rest of the world at cheaper world prices rather than from the EU. Let's look at UK goods exports to the EU excluding food. Our largest export is petroleum and petroleum products. There are very small or no tariffs at all on this segment so exports would be almost entirely unaffected. Road vehicles is the second largest category of UK exports to the EU at £17.3 billion. Finnish cars, for example, have a 10% tariff on them. But given that we import £46.5 billion worth of vehicles from the EU, consumers might choose to buy a few less BMWs and Volkswagens due to an increase in prices and buy more UK assembled cars from Japanese manufacturers, for example. Cars are not commodity items, they're high value-added items. 
If the UK government chose to impose tariffs at the same level as current EU tariffs, demand would reduce a little, certainly, but it wouldn't wipe out demand for these EU products. Many would still buy BMWs, Mercedes, Audis and other makes from the EU. Nor likewise would tariffs wipe out demand for UK value-added exports. The vast majority of our exports are in fact high value-added items, or items with very low or zero tariffs on them. Pharmaceutical products, our third largest exports outside food and drink products, for example, mainly have very low or zero tariffs on them. So far from it being the case of Japanese vehicle manufacturers closing UK plants down, as the media may have suggested, they might in fact need to increase capacity to deal with increased demand. And likewise, EU manufacturers might in all likelihood want to invest in plants and local employment in the UK to compete for a larger share of our huge domestic market, rather than face tariffs from exporting finished cars to the UK from EU assembly plants. The UK government might even decide to support the rebirth of a UK car industry based on new electric and battery-based technologies, where we currently have some technological advantages. Many of the economic models that were touted by opponents of our leaving the EU said that the cost of our imports would increase because they assumed that full EU tariffs would be charged by the UK government on our imports from the EU. Many economists, when asked if prices would increase, confirmed that in line with these models, logically if the government did charge EU tariffs, that prices would go up. Obviously true, but very misleading, because it entirely ignores the fact that having left the EU, it is the UK government, not the EU, who decide what tariffs we charge on our imports. In the run-up to March the 29th, the day we were originally due to leave the EU, the Department for International Trade announced that they planned to slash tariffs. In fact, 87% of imported goods by total value would have no tariffs on them at all. The government's plan for tariffs was designed to protect UK producers, but to remove tariffs on goods which we did not produce in the UK. So prices on exports to the UK from the EU would in large part be unaffected by tariffs. Prices would stay the same. Currently, the UK is forced to charge the EU's common external tariff, the CET as it's known, on imports from outside the EU. In 2018, we imported £312 billion worth of goods and services from other countries outside the EU. However, the UK government doesn't get to keep all that tariff money. In fact, 80% of it is paid to the EU. Outside the EU, with tariffs slashed, the prices for imported goods from outside the EU would in fact fall, exactly the opposite of what many who oppose the UK leaving the EU have stated. In reality, the EU know that when we leave the European Union, and the EU Customs Union in particular, the UK government will once again, for the first time for nearly 50 years, have full control of the crucial, powerful economic lever over our international trade. Our government can then tailor our tariffs and other trade barriers such as product standards and specifications not to suit producers from 28 EU nations but to suit UK producers, UK consumers and the overall health and benefit of the UK economy. When it does make sense to provide protection for UK producers or to enable infant industries to grow and flourish, the UK government will be free to impose its own tariff on imports and the UK exchequer will benefit from the flow of tariff income rather than the EU in Brussels. Let's look a little more closely at UK-EU trade. As we can see here, the UK's exports to the EU are 60% goods and 40% services. Coming the other way, the EU exports 75% goods and 25% services to the UK it's worth pointing out that there are no tariffs on services, only on goods. This illustrates why the EU doesn't just want to maintain access to UK markets free of tariffs, but it also wants the UK to stay in the EU Customs Union. Because only if the UK stays in the Customs Union can the EU determine the terms of trade that the UK has with the rest of the world and therefore maintain the volume of its exports to us. Outside the EU Customs Union, we'll be able to import the goods we need more cheaply from the rest of the world rather than the EU. It also illustrates a major economic disadvantage for the UK of staying in the EU. 
Despite the UK economy being a producer of 80% services rather than goods, only half that, 40% of our exports to the EU, are services. Why? A big clue to the answer to that is illustrated here. The UK's largest surplus in services sold to all EU member states is with the Netherlands, a small country of 17 million people. Incidentally, the deficit we have with Spain is all those sunny holidays we take there. Let's take a look at the UK's services exports to the EU. The largest category is business services, legal, accounting, advertising, R&D, architecture and so on. The second largest is financial services. All of these services rely on large flows of communication between UK suppliers and international customers. And why, therefore, is the Netherlands such a large market for UK services? The simple fact that over 90% of people in the Netherlands speak English is a huge factor. And it illustrates why, as an advanced services-based economy, the UK's markets for its services are global. And the markets that we can best serve are those where English is spoken either natively or as a widely spoken language. They are our natural markets. English-speaking countries and developing economies are where the biggest opportunities lie. And UK trade policy, therefore, needs to be geared, not primarily to European markets that have similarly advanced economies to our own, and which are largely served by their own service sectors, but to markets where our language, legal and financial systems and global reach give us natural advantage. And the lever that our trade negotiators will have under their control when we leave the EU will enable them to trade the lowering of trade barriers in other countries to allow UK firms to win business in those markets for access to our large domestic market for their goods. That will enable UK firms to exploit huge new opportunities. Back in 2017, the Hollywood actor Michael Caine said, when speaking in favour of Brexit, I'd rather be a poor master than a rich slave. Unfortunately, in doing so, he perpetuated a myth. He assumed that Brexit would make people poorer, but it would be worth it. He's a great actor and a hopeless economist, and he really shouldn't write his own lines. Because the truth is that Brexit provides the opportunity to be more prosperous and be in control of our destiny. The two are inextricably linked because, in fact, we can be more prosperous precisely because we can control our destiny. The economic myth of the EU is based on years of disinformation from those who are ideologically bought into a particular European dream of a single European state or a European empire, as Mr Verhofstadt put it to his fans at the Liberal Democrats conference. The world of tomorrow is a world of empires in which we European and you British can only defend your interests, your way of life by doing it together in a European framework and in the European Union. Can anyone doubt it after that? How could the UK be better off outside a market of 500 million people, the EU fanatics ask? As I've illustrated, the answer is that being part of a large political construct that binds the hands of our government and therefore prevents it from being able to structure our economy for the benefit of our people is a major disadvantage. We are a great market for EU agricultural and industrial produce, but it's not such a great market for us. An 80% services economy is by its nature a global player. We don't rely on geographical proximity for the major scope of our exports. The good news is that sovereignty doesn't have a price tag attached. It promises a huge dividend. With economic sovereignty restored, the UK will finally be free to provide state aid to protect critical strategic industries such as the steel and defence industries, and to provide support for the new growth industries of the future. We do not live in an age of empires as the strangely antiquated ideas of Mr Verhofstadt would have it. We live in a globally interconnected world, in a nation that has moved well beyond its age of empire. The other great nations of the world are keen to do business with us. The USA, India, China, Australia, New Zealand, the list just keeps growing. There'll be changes, adjustments and transitions, Old markets will decline, new markets will rise. That's business. And the UK, in my lifetime, has never been in a better position to exploit it. To see our future videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon. That way you'll get a notification by email as soon as a new video is available. 
In the meantime, please do help us out and like and share or retweet this post so your friends and followers can see it too. Thanks for watching. Please do share this. See you next time.